to let you start, Kirsten. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nikki, and huge thanks to everybody at Norwich Research School for inviting me to, to come along and talk. And, and thank you to you guys for attending. Um, I'm only just imagining the day-to-day -day logistics going on in schools at the moment. And as Nikki said, I'm in there two days a week myself. So I hope this is a chance to step back and just reflect and to share some practice with particular focus on social and emotional learning. And in addition to what Nikki introduced um, about me, I'll add that I am a trained Key Stage 2 teacher. So for many years taught in primary schools near York, um, Oxford, before moving to, to Shropshire. Um, very interested in outdoor education as a forest school leader for some time and all kinds of links that, that, that go towards that. But the, the role at EEF is really interesting, um, a, a really a real honour to be able to be well embedded in the evidence whilst trying to bridge the gap between that and schools, exemplify really good practice and, and share the evidence hopefully in a way that, that is useful and helpful in schools. So in terms of this session, we've got um, around about an hour and we can pop to the next slide, Nikki. And there will be little bits of inter interaction. Don't be too scared, but it'll be great to see if you're if you're using the chat, um, you know, any questions that you've got as we go along. But it'd be great to have also a piece of paper and a pen because we might be sort of sketching down some ideas as, as we go through. Um, so something I think that we really know about with CELL um, is that language matters and we're going to go through what is CELL, why is CELL important, we'll have a look at the Education Endowment Foundation guidance report on CELL and the caveat there is that it's CELL in primary schools um, but we'll pick up some principles for secondary as well and then as Nikki said introduce this idea of effective learning behaviours and where CELL fits in amongst that. So we will start straight away with a little activity. Um, so thinking about language around social and emotional learning is really important. And on the next slide, we have got a diamond nine activity. So you'll see a whole series of vocabulary around cell around behavior um, and what I'd like to do is just have a little moment just to stop and think about your beliefs your culture in school and the things that are most important to you so the idea of the diamond nine is your most important beliefs and cultures go towards the top and um, with your least important down the bottom and I know that can be quite hard to, to sift those out so if I just pause for 60 seconds or so and have a go at just sketching out um, what you feel is most important. And in a minute, it would be great to share your top three in the chat, but just to have a moment to think about that in your setting. Yeah. He was actually wonderful. Brilliant. That's good. I thought we were going to have a moment. Um, we very nearly did, but he did do exactly the right thing. Let me check I'm muted. Um, You're not muted at the moment. <laughs> So when you're ready, if you can, if you don't mind sharing your top three, the three that you feel are the most important and represent your culture in school. Thank you, Roger. Okay, we've got respect, resilience, well-being, um, positive mental health, 
quite right, encompassing a few of the others, shared vision, positive relationships. Again, positive relationships, resilience, well-being. Shared vision, culture, restorative justice, communication. Positive relationships comes up again and again. That's great. Thank you for sharing those. Um, and it, wouldn't it be interesting to do something like this with a colleague in school? Um, do they match? Do they align? Do they align perhaps with your, your school ethos, your school vision? How well is that lived through your relationships with pupils, relationships with parents? And I wonder if parents and pupils did this as well, would they come up with some of those same words? And the reason for, for starting with something like this is to, to really highlight that language makes a difference. And I think it, it's, language can be different across phases as well. Primary and secondary schools talking about social emotional learning can sound quite different. And really developing that shared language, and that st shared understanding means that we can be much more explicit about social emotional learning in schools. So if we have a look at some of the debates, so Nikki, if we can move on. There are a number of misconceptions, things to be aware of around cell, um, and there's just some of them on the screen here, some of them perhaps more relevant to primary or more relevant to secondary. The issue around whose responsibility is it, who ties the um, explicit teaching of cell in together in, in, in school. I'm a subject specialist, nothing to do with me. Um, cell isn't measurable, I've got exams to do, I've got a full curriculum as it is. Um, the idea that the more we talk about it, the worse it gets. So there's a lot of these sorts of misconceptions around cell. And one that I would add in there, which was really pertinent when EEF were, were writing the guidance report, is schools saying, well, we do cell already, we do it really well. Um, or cell being seen as this add-on, this additional thing that we just don't have time for. And it's quite interesting, isn't it, since, um, since COVID-19 and the very different circumstance we find ourselves in now, I wonder whether that view still holds, you know, we do sell already because I think people have been much more reflective about stepping back and saying, well, actually, let's have a look at our practice. Are we really having an impact um, with our students, with our pupils? So on the next slide, we've got um, a whole sample of headlines. You'll be familiar with so many of these and I'll just be quiet for a minute while you take some of those in. So not only have we got the language around cell, we've got misconceptions, we've got schools saying we do it already, um, but we have overlaid on this, this immediate challenge now around COVID-19, around talk about recovery curriculum, talking about positive mental health, um, talking about individual families suffering bereavement, sudden local lockdowns and those changes in routine, the changes in self-regulation that both pupils and families are, are living through. Um, and if we do feel that we do sell already, it feels a really good time to press pause, to reflect on practice in school and look at that best available evidence. And how do we move beyond these misconceptions? How do we move beyond these de debates and look at the evidence that we have? So next slide, please, Nikki. On the, in the Education Endowment Foundation is dedicated to breaking the link between family income and educational achievement. Um, the EEF are involved in generation and synthesis of evidence, but also mobilisation of this evidence. And Norwich Research School is one example of many across England offering training, offering a place to share practice, to amplify voices from the classroom so that we can learn from each other. And this quote from the CEO, Becky Francis, um, identifies that, that challenge, um, making evidence truly accessible to teachers and senior leaders. And then moving on, using this evidence, we know that we can be provided with best bets. We can look at these to help teachers and, and leaders. 
but we need to have our professional expertise our knowledge of local context is really key so we're going to dig deeper into cell um, and we'll start that with the next slide so this this next one was taken um, in collaboration with the early intervention foundation and i'll come back to them in a minute because they've worked very much with the education endowment foundation on on their work on cell so this this idea about these key definitions um, but also this being an implementation challenge for schools getting it right implementing it being really explicit about modelling um, and teaching these skills. There's quite a range of terms, quite a range of definitions, and we touched on that with that Diamond 9 activity. And there's different meanings for different audiences. So if we go to the next one, we can really drill down into what cell is. Um, I think you might have to forward on a few more there, Nikki. Thank you. So cell is an umbrella term and recognises the varied approaches that schools might use to deliver to deliver cell and it'd be interesting for you to think about what terminology you think whilst you have a look at this slide and we can think about it as being this process where children are managing their emotions they're setting these goals showing empathy they're managing impulses of emotions they're able to name these emotions and making these decisions and that might well come ac across in our universal cell cu curriculum within school that's around explicit teaching integrating cell school skills um, and application into everyday classroom it could be whole school interventions and i'm talking about teaching and learning still the school ethos and environment involving family and, and community but it also could be targeted interventions intensive support for pupils at higher risk you know developing those coping skills and decreasing the risk of negative mental health and those terms that are popping up on the slide are things that we're familiar in school that overlap with with some of those things i've already described and you've got um, in the middle of this circle you've got cell you've got these five core competencies and around that the classroom the school and the home and the wider community so the next slide gives us a definition of cell that comes from um, a US study and I'll just uh, give you a moment to read that on the left. And that is from a US study and we'll, we'll come back to why the US is, is featuring quite quite a bit in this. Um, but there again, we've got those five cell competencies. So you've got areas around that self awareness and self management, those um, managing impulses of emotions, um, recognizing their own perseverance, their own goal setting and so on. You've also got responsible decision making, problem solving, evaluating, but then also social awareness and relationship skills. We'll have a look at those in more detail when we come back to the guidance a little bit later on. So why does cell matter? On the next slide, we have got um, a document from the Early Intervention Foundation. Um, and Alicia Clark from that organisation was one of the co-authors for the cell guidance with, with EEF. And they put this together to um, try and communicate why cell matters, but also produced a version about why cell matters in COVID times as well. And if you were to Google Early Intervention Foundation um, cell resources, You'll, they'll, you'll see that they've put together a number of strategies which are really useful um, and they've been valuable partners in this work. So on to the next one, please, Nikki. We've got examples of uh, um, studies highlighting development of cell being a largely unrecognised part of, of a teacher's job. Um, schools feel it's important and it's especially likely to be important for our most disadvantaged pupils. Um, and I think just skip on another couple there, Nikki, and that'll take us to the next slide. So there are meta-analysis of cell interventions, and you can see here that it's a considerable number of, of children who have been involved in this. Um, and the analysis from EEF is, shows a four-month 
um, increase in attainment compared to you know those who have not taken part in programs and we've got this increase in cell skills positive attitudes social behaviors and later down the line we've got less emotional stress lower drug use and so on and those links are really really clear um, there's also links to long-term well-being if we go on to the next slide please nikki so the socioeconomic gradient in cell skills on entry to school are predictive of other outcomes so for example if you take two children in with the same key stage one scores and one has got higher cell skills than the other they will be predicted to do better at key stage two and that's linked to decreasing mental health difficulties so this long-term well-being this idea of transition through the education system and beyond um, is very much linked linked with developing these cell competencies there are also links to um, teacher job satisfaction so if we pop on to the next slide um, this idea of protective factors for mental health those teachers who've been involved in cell training report that this has improved their own relationship with pupils they've been able to develop a manager they manage these nurturing relationships behavior in the classroom has, has improved and being able to name these emotions and model them explicitly with the children has enabled them to regulate their own emotions. So some real links with, with teacher job satisfaction. I probably couldn't go as far to say whether that would affect recruitment and retainment and retaining teachers, but um, that's, that's got to be a positive thing. So if we go on to the next one, we'll have a look at introducing the guide from the Education Endowment Foundation. So this is improving social and emotional learning for primary schools um, and it was worked on with an advisory panel and reviewers and they pull these guidance reports together and formulate recommendations which we hope are useful to the to the profession. And if you Google the EEF cell guidance, what you'll find on that page are there's some additional tools as well. So within there, there's an, a, a cell audit and discussion tool, which you might find useful to look at provision already and practice in your school um, and to, to really break cell down amongst all of those recommendations. And if we pop to the next one. In order to produce these guidance reports, it's, it's quite a long process. Um, there's the scoping process, there's all sorts of discussions with experts, um, and this guidance is for primary schools, but there are principles that we can draw out from secondary. So to arrive at the recommendations, the EEF reviewed best evidence, consulted teachers and experts, and I think the key thing with this one is that they identified core skills and strategies that occur frequently in cell programs that have good evidence of impact. The reason I say that is that many of these programs were from the US and knowledge about implementation of these programs is, is not as strong as we would like for English schools. So hence there is a really strong theme within this report on implementation and close monitoring of impact because we can't make those natural links to our settings and we'll come back to a, a, a real example of that um, a little bit later on. So if we go on to the next slide it will give you an overview of the recommendations and I'll just pause for a moment as you as you take that in. They are broadly in pairs so we've got two um, around teaching strategies, two around curriculum and two around whole school and implementation. And it would be great at this point if you do have any questions about what we've covered already. I can't actually see the chat at the moment, Nikki, um, but I'm sure you're having a look at that. But if you have got questions or comments and reflections, it'd be really useful to share those.
So what I'm planning to do is to go through each of these recommendations individually and for some of them just to pause and um, do a little bit of reflection on, on each one um, and we'll, we'll take, take you through that path and then at the end think about how cell can be brought together through effective learning behaviours. So the first recommendation I don't know quite how this PowerPoint is. You're going to have to scroll through several times there, Nikki. <laughs> Thank you. And probably one more. There we go. Two more. So the first recommendation is around teaching cell skills explicitly. Often schools report about them being squeezed into the margins of the timetable and it's an extra thing for teachers to do. Um, but actually dedicating time for instruction of these skills can be hard to deliver, but it's really important, therefore, to look at flexible strategies, look at teachable moments. And one example for that can be teach using stories um, to teach to teach cell. Um, but there are also many other ways and, and there are ways, especially at primary school, that are just so good at, at grabbing these moments and teaching them. But we need to really know what we're, what we're teaching we need to be explicit about those things and on the next slide it gives you a summary of the core competencies that we've already had a look at and they appear within the guidance and give us a little reminder so that's self-awareness and self-management social awareness and relationship skills and responsible decision making and i just want to pause for a moment and for you to just to think about what cell skills you explicitly teach already where do they fit um, we've already looked at you know where PSHE is or PSHCE or whatever you call it relationship sex education um, it could be through through the reading program it could be through subjects just have a think about where these fit already within your schools and it would be great to share some ideas in, in the chat Can I um, just clarify something? For, so do you mean when do we explicitly kind of think I'm now teaching self-management or do you mean when, so for example, if I do a team, a, you know, group work activity or something like that, then that might help or strengthen those skills. But you're talking here about when you actually almost do something with the purpose to teach self-management or is that what you mean or? I think so and I think it's a two-way thing isn't it sometimes it will be planning for that explicit teaching and it could be thinking about the assembly rotor for example it could be deliberate planning in of these things it could be that you're using a program already that delivers these in a sequenced and active way but it could also be moments that perhaps you've had recently where something's happened and actually it's been a really good moment to grab that and to say right that's a really good example of sharing goals about relationship building um, about naming these emotions and managing managing impulses of behavior so either either planned or teachable moments Well, that's interesting Molly we'll come to we'll talk about paths a little bit later might ask about your experience of it if that's okay <laughs> we'll come to that one in a bit thank you Roger for that yeah often PSHCE or whatever the secondary school calls it you know it's boxed up nicely that's where we deliver it there and perhaps it doesn't come into to other areas of the school I think it should and, that, and you know it can come back to responsibilities can't it who leads this uh, staff training of course so early years absolutely part of the core curriculum and i think we have a lot to learn from our early years colleagues yes building building in time for for relationships is interesting to think about um, a lot of schools call them pupil passports where you are 
you, and often they're used with pupils with a special educational needs and disability and you're looking at um, their particular interests, their strengths, their aspirations, but you're also thinking about um, how they need support um, and ways, ways to support them in the classroom. And those are great. We do them at our school for everybody and we review them every year and they're, they're done with the form tutor, but they're also communicated to staff through school briefings, student briefings where, you know, we can really share those hooks, those things that are engaging those particular students, linking to aspirations and getting to know them really well. And that can build a, a lot of relationship um, positive relationships that way and there are links aren't there to there's a there's another guidance report on improving behavior from the education endowment foundation which talks about all pupils having a relationship with a trusted adult in school and those sorts of things build in really nicely but sometimes finding ways to communicate that across the school is challenging Yeah, thank you for that, Claire. Pastoral conversations, managing conflicts in, in friendship groups, the, the idea of um, restorative justice has already come up earlier in the chat. And sometimes it's just building that training and awareness amongst staff to say, these are the core competencies, these are the things that we should be teaching, and then enabling staff to be able to grab those teachable moments. So we'll have a look at the next recommendation and zoom in a little bit onto, the, onto this because integrating and modeling cell teaching through, cell skills, sorry, through everyday teaching is the second of these recommendations um, in terms of teaching. So grabbing these teachable moments, and um, I'm going to wave a book at you, which is this one, which I recently read by Mark Smith. It's called Becoming Buoyant. And this really helped me to consider the day to day detail of building resilience and developing cell skills. And he looks at internal and external factors and, and the wider family situation and, and community. Um, but that I found was a really useful read to, to think about this a little bit more. So these teachable moments, um, we're going to share a blog and I think this was sent out to you ahead of this session. And this blog was written by um, a colleague who works in the primary school across the road from me. So she's a year five teacher presently. She was year six last year and deputy head. In fact, she's just got a headship. She won't mind me telling you. Um, so it's very exciting for her. But reading is her thing. So if you're on Twitter and you want to know recommendations for reading and especially linked to sell, get in touch with Beth Rowe. She's great. Um, and she uses reading with her class to explicitly teach sell. So I would just like to test, take a few minutes to give you a chance to read that blog. It's only a sort of three or four minute read. And think about how you use whole class reading in for sell in your school. Um, and think about how you use it in subjects as well and we'll share it we'll share a few of those afterwards so have a think about how you use reading for cell and whether you're able to use that in subjects
you go on to the next slide, Nikki, please. It's got the two questions that we're, we're thinking about. Yes, I think that book was Anne Booth, Amanda. I think there's a, a link within that article that takes you to, to more information on those the books that Beth mentions. So are there ways that you have used reading for cell in your school? Are there subject specific texts that anyone's used to, uh, to highlight cell skills? If you want to pop, pop your ideas into the chat, that would be great. I'm fascinated, Claire, to know why it's a fast read. Feel free to just to unmute and tell us if you're happy to. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> oh, we've got some feedback because there's both of us in the same room. There we go. Um, yes so we as opposed to a slow read so a slow read is one that we kind of study in the old-fashioned way of studying a a novel you know in detail looking at the language and extracts and things like that whereas a fast read is just to be read and loved and enjoyed and um you know for for its own sake and you can have really rich conversations about um you know characters and and things like that it's a chance to try something new as well because you know some of, some of the less tried and tested texts can be you know a bit intimidating can't they to study and um, you know, to go all in with, whereas a, a fast read allows you to try some things out. So we were actually just talking about how Wonder would be a great um, fast read. So that's one we're going to try. Brilliant. Thanks for sharing that, Claire. And the idea that Beth says about walking in someone else's shoes, you know, that lovely analogy of, of taking somebody on a journey. I love the idea of a fast read. Thank you for that. Um, and in terms of subject, and that's quite interesting. We've, we've something that we've just put um, into our school um, in terms of science is that we, we decided to put some reading into every topic that Key Stage 3 cover. So there is a piece of reading, um, which and a piece of text, which isn't necessarily, I mean, it could be from the news, it could be more fiction based, but it relates to the topic. And we build in reciprocal reading type techniques around predicting, questioning, clarifying and summarising, but whilst also keeping these core competencies in mind. So I'll give you an example. Um, within one of the biology topics, we look at IVF um, as, as a process and we talk about that we have a, a role play around that, but we use a text to, to introduce that to the children. And the role play brings in all sorts of different, different types of couples going through IVF and we can really develop that, those relationship skills. We can, we can develop that social awareness. Um, and that's something that we're, we're trialing in science this this year and it's just been really really popular the children have enjoyed reading the different types of texts um, and enjoyed really discussing them and that's been quite quite a different thing for us to try in terms of a secondary school in in subject areas i'm just having a little look at the questions nikki is there anything coming through that there's some great suggestions there thank you for those Okay, so reading is reading is one thing. So we've got this idea of, of cell teaching strategies. Um, but then the next little bit of, um, of recommendations is around interventions. So uh, this is where we're going to pick up on, on paths. So I gather one, one of you are already doing this. So thinking about adopting a cell programme. It's not right for every school, but some schools might well be considering that as an option. 
and PATHS enhances children's cell development. It, there's a full training program and it's been widely adopted um, internationally. There's lots of, lots of countries doing this one. It's for four to 12 year olds and it's multiple lessons through a week. It's two to three lessons a week. And it's teaching those five core cell core competencies. There's really strong evidence from US and European trials um, in terms of this, the social, social emotional learning skills, behaviour, reduction in hyper, hyperactivity and aggressive behaviour um, and attention improvements. However, and there is a however, um, the programme has been evaluated in the UK and the findings are less positive and teachers report a lack of time to fit it into the curriculum and so it's not just a case of taking a program and adapting it it's really difficult to implement it's really difficult to implement well and that implementation quality matters and this is what the evidence is telling us that high fidelity that means really following the handbook absolutely um, is really important so there are databases you can have a look at to explore programs. Um, there is the EEF tool, toolkit, which has got um, links to all sorts of programs that have been evaluated, but also the, educate, uh, the Early Intervention Foundation also have a list of programs. And interestingly, sometimes the findings are slightly different because they're measuring different things or it's been implemented in a different way. But they are useful signposts to where you can have a look at evidence based programs. But recommendation four that we'll go on to next looks at where schools are planning their own curriculum for cell and the recommended approach is following this safe framework so the curriculum is sequenced it's active it's focused and it's explicit and i like one of the little illustrations from the guidance which is in the bottom right there where they've really identified the different vocabulary in terms of emotional vocabulary that would be expected and appropriate for those different age, age ranges. So that really helps teachers to structure both those teachable moments, but also explicit teaching of cell skills. So it might well be that you have a look at some of those programmes, you look at the overarching principles that have had a positive effect, but you're building something that is appropriate for your school. And many schools will do that. And the audit tool that I referenced earlier that's, that's on, the, um, on the website will help you through that process to really ensure that's embedded. Then the last two recommendations are around whole school implementation. So recommendation five is re reinforcing cell skills through a whole school ethos. And there are some questions here. So does your behavior policy align with your approach to social and emotional learning? Are self-regulation of cell skills taught in school? Do they link with working with parents? There are some interesting links there where working with parents is shown to be really effective, but especially around self-regulation of routines and goals, finding a place to work, um, finding a safe space and so on. So are there links with how we're, how we're modelling these cell schools in school and how are we uh, communicating those with parents? Um, and I'll, I'll give you one example from, from lockdown. So Billsley, which is one of our um, research schools, which is based in Birmingham, it's a primary school, um, started to experiment a little bit with, with again, with reading, with one-to-one -one reading during lockdown. Um, and some of their quite experienced teachers were having to self-isolate and so they were running these programs and doing one-to-one -one reading with pupils online but with the parent there as well and so they were modeling though the not only the reading skills but also this idea of treading in someone else's shoes and, and the discussions around comprehension and pulling out that self-regulation pulling out the emotional vocabulary and really helping parents to have those conversations and they reported that that really specific praise from parents coming through because they were being guided through that process but then they also delivered one of those reading sessions just with their child on their own and they were doing them really consistently and it's something that the parents enjoyed the child enjoyed the teacher felt had a real impact and it's something they're looking at continuing post lockdown so they're still carrying on with that and they felt that that was really strengthening relationships with families as well 
So thinking about your whole school ethos is really important. And then the final recommendation, number six, is around planning, monitoring and, and supporting that change. So you'll remember that the, the caveat with this evidence was around many US interventions. It was around being in primary school and it was around looking at that best international evidence. And so being explicit about what those core skills were that had the impact means that we can start to monitor the progress and the impact of anything that we're implementing. There are barriers. We've already discussed fitting cell into the curriculum, staff buy-in, that again, that shared language, training, um, but good, there is good evidence that implementation done well predicts positive cell outcomes. So how do we share this, share this value? You know, we can look at the school's organisation, we can look at management structures, who's got responsibility for this? Is it a shared responsibility? How do we develop relationships? What does the physical environment do to support us with that? And how is that school vision, that school ethos lived through the pupils, through the staff, through the parents? training really important reinforcing these positive cell skills as we see them and praising them and in, obviously involving partners and services and linking to the community where more bespoke um, support is required and when i think about this one um, i think about a child that i taught in primary school let's just call him oliver for now um, so oliver joined us in year two he had a diagnosis of autism um, and when he first arrived with us, he would really hide under the beanbags in the classroom, make a lot of noise and couldn't interact at all with the class. Um, the, the stimulus around the class was just too much. Um, he wasn't having conversations and it was a really difficult start. There was no way for Oliver, we were going to just be able to put in an intervention and that, that would have, have, have worked for him. This was going to have to be a whole school approach. So not only have we got the sort of reasonable adjustments along with the with the send um, area, we needed to have really well trained staff and we needed to start building relationships, building relationships with Oliver, building relationships between the teachers and the teaching assistants who were working with him and the people outside at dinner time and everybody around him at school, but also building relationships with his family where they hadn't had positive previous experiences and they'd moved him to, to our school for, for a hope of a positive learning outcome. Um, he needed to be able to name these emotions. He needed to be able to anticipate the triggers of these emotions. He needed to be able to expand that vocabulary and that speech and language and communication difficulty provided an additional challenge for him. And he needed to start to manage these, these strong impulses. Uh, I remember taking them out on a, a forest school um, outing. We were just, just in the school grounds and we were around the pond and were really lucky enough to see a dragonfly emerging from the lava. And he said, that is the single most exciting thing that has ever happened in my life. I, I will never forget that quote. It's just going to live with me. It's one of those things in your teaching career that you just go, yes, a golden moment. And building his relationships with peers, building his own communication skills, building in those cell competencies and, and all of that, that managing of his own emotions. Um, I bumped into, so I heard that um, he'd got a place at university, which is really exciting. Um, but his mum said that he wasn't able to do a full transition to university. So he was traveling from home to university each day for year one. But I just heard now that he's just started year two and he's moved into halls of residence. And it is just the most incredible story. And you know these are stories that we that we have all the time these are skills that we're developing in in our in our relationships with children all the time and there are risk points aren't there and i think I, what i want to do is come on to learning behaviors because i think if we don't have all of that around the child and if we don't have that implementation all around the child we're going to be losing them and parts of that puzzle for that child will be missing so Learning behaviours, sorry, there's rather a lot of type on that on that slide, but it's something that we're trying to do at EEF to try and exemplify what a situation for someone like Oliver, but actually for every child, 
and why that's important. So we've pulled together five guidance reports. So we've got improving behaviour, we've got metacognition and self-regulation, working with parents, special educational needs in mainstream schools and cell. And having all of those locked together brings, brings part of the puzzles together. And what I think probably the best way to explain this is a short video. So Nick is going to put a link into the chat. It's about a two and a half minute video. So I would um, welcome you to, to watch that. We'll do, we'll do a bit of a goggle box moment where we can see each other watching the video. Uh, and um, it explains a little bit about the background to learning behaviours. Um, and then we'll, we'll pick it up when we come back together. But it's just a two and a half minute video. And if you can, I think we're all on mute, so that will work. Well, I hope I've given you enough time to to have a listen to that video and of course you're welcome to share that with colleagues if you would find that useful and um, there are some recent blogs around learning behaviours that give you a little bit more information but cell is such a crucial part of that learning behaviours puzzle and, and something that animation does is, is pull that cell part out and you can see how that just makes every, just things aren't so firm for that child and we can we can think about Oliver and we've all got a child we can imagine in the center of that pentagon and we can use that almost as a case study to think about what's working well in our schools and things that are a challenge for us things that we want to improve and within of course each of those puzzle pieces is a huge amount of evidence and I wouldn't suggest that a school tries to do all five but picking a few things that you really want to work on and doing a few things differently and doing them well um, is a really good bet. 
but if that uh, that whole journey for Oliver hadn't quite panned out, I mean, transition, a really important part, not just moving into our schools, but moving on to the next stages. Um, changes in environment from primary to secondary to sixth form to university and just that building of resilience and how that looks different for different ages, building that understanding of, of individual needs alongside strengthening social and emotional learning skills is crucial. So I hope that learning behaviours model gives you something, something to think about and something to go out following this session. And um, there is some additional reading that, that Susie will be able to send out. But the next slide just gives you a, a couple of things to, to think about following this, this session we've spent together. So I'll just um, be quiet while you have a read of that and a think. Thanks, Nikki. And the next slide will just give you a little bit more to dig into if you this hasn't been enough and you want to find out some more. So um, there are three recommended pieces of reading. Um, we'll get those sent out to you um, after this session so that you've got links to them. So the Preparing for Effective Cell Implementation is a document that we use at EEF for, um, when we do the cell deep dive and it gives a really good flavour and it's only seven pages long, which isn't too long. Um, and then we've got a, an Effective Learning Behaviours blog from me um, and and that just gives a little bit of background and that has the video embedded in it as well. Um, but also something from Jean Gross, who was a co-author of the Cell Guidance Report. And she wrote for us around closures, um, school closures and partial school closures and looking at ways that schools can, can adopt simple little practices just to keep those cell threads intact. So that's a, that's a nice read because even you know, without closures, there's some nice, nice little takeaways there. Um, so it just leaves me to say thank you, enormous thanks for, for you to finding finding an hour's time and for those of you clicking in at a later date for, for doing that and thanks to Norwich Research School for setting up this, this series of, of great speakers and, uh, and really nice to be part of it. We're really keen to share case studies, we're really keen to share voices from the classroom to exemplify good practice so where you think oh yes you know we do that and it's working really well do get in touch um, it would be great to hear from you so thank you. Thank you so much Kirsten. Um, I, I've learned so much different today and I, I've already kind of read and talked about this to you every time um, I speak to you I learn more so thank you and and I, 